fact was it was a you know it was a it was a medical condition and needed treatment and uh, so the ethical dilemma didn't actually arise. You've never then been cast down by the fragility of the self. Um, I. D- I mean, obviously, you've dealt with tragic cases. Yeah, I. The, one of the first cases in the book, um, the eggshell boy story. He fell down a lift shaft. He fell down a lift shaft, um, and was left with very severe brain damage. That really shook me. I was, I was, I was a, a new trainee at the time. That really left a mark on me. And I realised that I wasn't... You know, you go through childhood and adolescence thinking you're pretty immortal and, and invulnerable, and you suddenly realise that, well, actually, the world is... We are fragile things in a, in a, in a difficult world and a, and a random world, a capricious world. And that was a shock, so yes. Um, but um, if we don't accept that we're fragile, then... Um, we run into other kinds of problems and um, you know it's a part of becoming insightful about what it means to be a person is to realise that we're fragile Do you think that that we will ever discover a, a theory of everything to, dis, to, to cover the brain and the self that takes us further than what we know now? I think there's a boundary that we I don't see how we're going to cross it I mean at the moment we know a lot I think neuropsychology and neuroscience has come on in leaps and bounds, theoretically, and in terms of the way we can investigate the brain. Because? Because of uh, scans, scans and, and more sophisticated ways to analyse brain, the effects of brain damage and put those two together. It's a very powerful combination. And so we've learnt a lot more over the last 20 years or so about language, about memory, about how we control voluntary actions. Uh, what we don't really know very much more about is how those things go together to produce this sense of the kind of introspective self. And I think there's a boundary because I think we can, what we've come to realise is that there is no central core. These things hang together, uh, that they're bound together by um, language and memory, but there is no central core. And furthermore, that when we talk about selves, the sort of language we use, we go into into social, into the social realm. And so it's interactions between people that become the focus rather than what goes on internally within a single brain. Uh-huh. So it's how brains are an interaction that produces meaning and emotions and selves. And once you go outside of the boundary of the so self... So it always is bigger than both of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As it were. Um, the, yeah, the whole is greater than some of the parts, is what right. I'm saying. Yeah, so that, you know, to understand emotions, you have to understand more than one person. You know, you have to understand brains in interaction rather than in isolation. Mm. Studying brains in isolation would take you so far, but we need different concepts, and they're social concepts and they're cultural concepts that you can't easily translate back into the neurons. The, um, the whole idea of... Of, of this kind, your kind of book, it's, you've been compared to Oliver Sacks, and, you know, Luria remains incredibly attractive in terms mm, of mm. what he was describing, is why do we find it so fascinating? Why do I find your book so fascinating? Oh, well, I'm glad you do. I, I think well, it, anybody, I mean, I, I, because it's about ourselves, we're all, we, it, we all like stories. It's about what would happen if something it's went wrong. It's a what-if kind of thing. Yeah. What, what if, what might be. Uh, but there's yeah. more, you're saying there's more than voyeurism in this kind of writing, aren't you? I was quite careful to try and avoid that. And I think you can't avoid it absolutely. Um, because if you're describing things which are gruesome, then people will read it for different reasons. But that was clearly not the point of it. What I was trying to do was to extract from the occasionally gruesome imagery the spark of humanity and what really matters about um, people, for example, with the, the eggshell boy who seemed to be completely wrecked, but when his mother comes into the room and when they begin to interact, then you know the whole is greater than some of the parts, and that interaction revealed things that my interaction with him couldn't reveal. So they, they kind of there was a, there were templates that matched, and they produced a picture that I couldn't see. And I think it's that's a lovely observation, but. Does it cheer me up? No. What, what, what makes you miserable about it? 
But you have a, 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 a the actual boy who's broken, who will never regain mm. any kind of autonomy or any kind of observable self. Mm. And the only thing that makes him less than anguished is the presence of one person, his mother, who isn't going to be there mm. for always. Mm. Stuff like that makes me miserable. Yeah, okay, well, having kind of... If you thought about this, it doesn't take me to tell you the world's a shitty place, does it? I mean, there are horrible things that happen like that. And you could walk, you know, you'd find a, a brain rehab centre within about 10 miles of this place, I'm sure. Well, you'd find people not dissimilar to the character that I described. Mm. Um, so part of the function of a book like that is to say, well, look, just these things happen. They happen in ways that can be shocking that, uh, and we can feel disillusioned about ourselves. But if you feel disillusioned, it's because we're illusioned in the first place. Mm. Um, and actually, you can go onto any hospital and find real humanity and, and real the things that really matter in the midst of, all, of these sometimes horrific injuries and catastrophic situations. You will find those sparks of humanity, sparks of humour. Even if it's only transient, if it's very fleeting, where the mother interacts with the son, it seems to me worthwhile to, to preserve that. I take that point. But what I want is for you guys to know how to fix people. Will you ever be able to do that? Will you ever be able to fix the eggshell boy's brain? Um, do you imagine? I'm not, the, I'm not expert enough in that kind of area. I'm not a neurophysiologist. I'm not a neuropathologist. Um, my hunch is that probably in the not-too-distant future we'll find ways to repair damaged brain, whether we can do it to completely reconstitute it, because if it's gone, it's gone. If you have a part of the brain that, that houses emotional memories and it's wiped, then it's wiped.